Osma, Osma is a, a senior coastal engineer and team leader of coastal sciences engineering and planning team at Woods Hole. I think Woods Hole probably needs a very little introduction in this group. It's really an outstanding organization um, in, the, in the region and uh, in the global context. Her focus is on habitat restoration, shoreline protection, and climate change planning projects for a diverse client base. She specializes in applying numerical models to optimize engineering design and reduce overall project life cycle, project life cycle costs. Um, and we're really thrilled that he could be here today. Thanks, Elizabeth. I'm going to start my timer here. So if anybody hears like a big alarm going off, that means I my time is up. Um, Thanks for coming back after coffee break. Hopefully uh, the coffee can help uh, keep you awake because I'm not sure I would be able to, but we'll do the best I can. Um, so we're transitioning a little bit here because I'm an engineer by trade, right? So I'm a coastal engineer, which is a small branch of civil engineering. Um, and we're going to look at kind of what are we going to do? <laughs> what, how do coastal communities how do engineers, how do designers, planners start to transition in this new climate that we're facing? Um, you know, engineers want a number, right? So when they're designing something, they want to know, well, what do I design it to? What is my load? What is my force? What is my elevation that I need to go to? So it's not good enough sometimes to just say, well, it's, sea level's going to go up, and it's going to get warmer, and you're going to have more storms. A lot of times we need something more than that. Um, communities are in the same boat, right? They're, especially coastal communities, they need to start thinking about preparation. How are we going to prepare for this changing climate? So, I'm basically going to talk about three main points here. I'm really going to focus on number one and number three. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, sea level rise and storm surge. What is the probability of flooding? And Chris gave me a nice introduction because he had the three drivers. I'm going to be kind of referring to those drivers throughout. A little bit more as sea level rise and storm surge because my focus or case study I'm going to focus on is Boston. And sediment supply in an urban environment really doesn't come into play when you have seawalls everywhere and wharfs and harbors and hard landscape, right? But, but we will get back into the sediment issue as well. But Chris covered that nicely anyway. So really the first question is what is the probability of flooding? Right. What am I? What am I faced with as a community? What am I? What am I going to uh, be up against? Second is then what's vulnerable and what is the priority? Right. So if a community has all these assets, or a stakeholder has these different components to their system, right? where do they need to focus their funding, their emphasis to make it a climate resilient uh, system? Because they don't have infinite money to go out and fix it all for the next 100 years of the design life of the project, in many cases. They have to prioritize that. Then finally, what actually is the plan? What are the adaptations? And I'll go through some examples of those. I'm not going to cover everything under the sun, but I think I'll give you a good cross-section of what some of the adaptations you can do in the coastal environment. All right, so step one, how are we going to determine as a community what's vulnerable? There's a lot of tools out there, right? Some of you might be familiar with this. This is a FEMA map or a flood insurance rate map, firm as they're called. This is from a area in Boston. Um, so the yellow area indicates an area that would be delineated as a, as a flood zone or a, <clears throat> with a base flood elevation. Um, there's some issues with these, right? Their, their purpose isn't really for planning out in the future, right? It's really for insurance purposes, right? So they only look backwards. If they're not looking for it. They're looking at historical storms. They're only considering, you know, this 100-year storm event. Up here in the, north, in the northeast in Region 1, they don't even really use dynamic modeling. They just use historical water levels, and they basically do everything on this single transect. So elevations along this transect, it then gets mapped to a bigger area, right? So if you're thinking about climate change and future potential as a starting point, well, FEMA's not really going to work for that, right? You're, you're talking about what's happening today based on big historic storms. That's why Jim mentioned, hey, when we get a big storm and it causes all kinds of problems, we've got to reassess this because we didn't have that storm before, and we weren't really sure what was going to happen with that storm. So, you know, 
from the standpoint of a community planning to something out in the future, FEMA maps probably aren't the, really the best place to turn. The other big problem I have with FEMA maps is this, this 100 year storm categorization. Right? I, I, I really, with somebody I said, well, what is a 100 year storm going to do? Like, what do you mean a 100 year storm? It totally depends on what the central or the radius to maximum wind is, what the track line is, as Chris said. You know, with, with Sandy, a 100 year storm for this area, I mean, that storm is a 100 year storm coming. Well, it really, it's what the storm produces in terms of flood potential and water level. So it's really, you know, a 100 year water level that you really need to think about, not in terms of storms. But lay people always just think of the storm itself. We'll come back to that. But there's also these bathtub type maps. This is the Boston Harbor Association. Again, we've <clears throat> We're looking at, at Boston right now, but we can talk about that other areas as well. Um, this was a study done, and in, 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 I was actually involved with this from an adaptation standpoint for what can we do. I wasn't necessarily involved with the mapping of the flooding. Basically, bathtub maps are, okay, we have a certain sea level rise. Let's say we're going to have two feet of sea level rise, and we know that historic 100-year water surface elevation is another three feet. So let's just add five feet to everything. And then compare that to the water topography and then see what floods. Right? And sometimes they, you do some connectivity stuff, but water can't really get back there. And then you can come up with these flood depths. And, and they're a good first order approximation of water might be. Okay? They don't account for any kind of joint flood position. Right? So there's no winds, there's no waves in these things, there's no real storm, per se, or set of storms that occurs. Doesn't really include the effects of infrastructure. You have pumps. Boston has a couple of big dams, Charles River Dam, and the other dam that has pumps that stop flow on the Charles River and Mystic River. That's not in there. Um, doesn't account for precipitation, discharge down the river. So you're missing this combined joint probability of flooding. And one of the biggest things, especially here in the Northeast, doesn't account for tides, right? So everything is just, well, if it's mean high water, we'll just add that onto it, right? But that assumes it's always kind of high tide, right? With a 10 foot tide range, that's a pretty big, drastic, change in what your probabilities are of actually getting. Right? Because you, you're basically saying every storm that hits, hits that high tide. So there's some limitations in that. It's a good first order approximation. There's the uh, hurricane evacuation maps. Um, these are like the worst possible scenario. Right? This, they run a big hurricane or, or the biggest hurricane that mean high water. These are really for risk planning, right? So if you're a community and you're planning for risk, or if you're Logan International Airport, Massport, and you're planning for risk, you're basically saying, well, we, we have no chance. Right? I mean, it's, it's underwater. I, what can I do to adapt to this, right? But that's not really what these are for. This is really for finding evacuation, right? How do I escape in the case of the worst case scenario? This is a model, a uh, numerical model. Um, it's, a sl it's a slosh model. For the Northeast, it's a problem. Jim mentioned nor'easters here. Nor'easters are a big deal, okay? Why are they a big deal here? Hurricanes, when they come through, they got a lot of power, but they go through quick, right? So that whole tidal cycle thing, you know, the 12 hours in tidal cycle, it's got to hit at pretty much a rising tide for really for you to feel that full force. Nor'easters last a lot, a lot longer. Right? They're not necessarily as, as much immediate energy, but they, they span usually over one, if not two high tide cycles. So you're pretty much guaranteed to get some influence of that storm over the high tide. So if you're just simulating hurricanes, like in this case, you're missing a good portion, especially today, in present day, in the relatively near future, um, impacts of, of flooding. So why did we start looking at all this? Well, Mass DOT has this big thing in Boston called the Central Artery System. Big dick, is it's called. And all these maps were not good enough for Partners Healthcare Group, all the hospitals throughout the state, said this stuff is not good enough for us. We have to make really important decisions for human life, for in the case of the central artery, the only thorough for they are really through the state. And if part of that system goes out, we're sunk. Right? So we need better ability to figure out what's going on. Here's why what they had wasn't really good. Right? So this is the Boston area. This is a typical bathtub approach. Now, it looks a little different than depth because all I did here was said, okay, let's just add up sea level rise conditions, let's say two feet, and our surge, which is another three or four feet, and 
we'll say the water surface elevation in the bathtub gets up to 12 feet. Okay? So this is where flooding would occur at a 12 feet NAVD 88 level in the city. Okay? There it is. It's a flat bathtub, right? You filled it up. There's where water goes. If I do the same situation with the dynamic model, these are the real models. It's drastically different, right? We have actually a lot higher flooding down here in terms of water surface elevation, over 13 feet. Why? We have winds, we have waves pushing in from this longer approach direction, flooding down here. If I go back one, you notice the complete difference in flooding back in the Cambridge area because why? We have a Charles River Dam. That engineer is actually built that fairly well. That has pumps in it. That pumps water out when it goes around. Gets uh, higher because of discharge. Um, so when Mass DOT partners House with Plum, it says, you know, we need to do something better if we're really going to start to spend billions of dollars in fixing up all our assets for future climate change. So <clears throat> we're not the first people to do this, right? FEMA did. But again, and they did do it in Region 1, they only do it for present day, right? We said, let's do this for the future. Right? We worked with EPA, we did some work in Galveston, started it, we did some work on the West Coast Brave Harbor, we have results out there. And then this is going to be for the state of Massachusetts. We started with this pilot project in Boston area for, for Mass DOT. Um, so the models basically are a, a storm surge model and a wave model that tightly couple, coupled. They include most of the relevant physical processes you'd expect to happen during significant events, storm events. Okay? So we have winds, we have tides, we have storm surge, currents, sea level rise. We have discharge. These things are changing with a changing climate in the model as well, right? So we have increased precipitation, increased discharge down the river. We have the dams in there. We have the pump systems in the dam. So all this is functioning all at the same time. We're going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is the basis grid, or the base grid for the entire model. This is basically covers the whole North Atlantic. Why? Because we have to capture the large scale dynamic of these storms. So we don't just say, well, once we know what the storm happens right in Boston Harbor, good, we're, we've got the water levels, we're good. No, it's got different you know, track lines, different approaches. All these things matter, right? Nor'easters all come into play. We also have an unstructured grid, which basically means we get higher resolution as we get closer to. Uh, our areas of interest. Here's the Galveston case I mentioned. You can see right in Galveston, we're down to about five meter resolution. In Boston, we get down to about two to three meter resolution. And so every two meters, we have a little point where we have information on winds, waves, water levels, things of that nature. Here's what it looks like right in the Boston area. This is the financial district here, Port Point Channel. It's another viewpoint. This is the, uh, the blue line represents the edge of the model domain. That corresponds with a 30-foot NAVD-88 contour. So we're basically simulating what's happening everywhere in that domain. Um, the red zone is the focus area. The uh, black is the central artery system. As a side note, we took a lot of tours of the tunnel system. And it's an amazing engineered structure, though. It took a long time. There's a lot of financial problems with it. Um, but it's, it's actually amazing. The only problem with it is it's, it's so interconnected. Um, and so, and it lacks a lot of, it doesn't have a lot of redundant features, right? So, if, if event building gets affected, you gotta shut the whole tunnel down. If an egress gets affected, you gotta shut the whole tunnel down. If something goes into the MBTA uh, blue line station over an aquarium and plugs into the tunnel, you gotta shut it down, right? So, if a pump system goes, you got to shut down. There's all these features that, in of themselves, make it a, an amazing uh, structure, but it just isn't very resilient to climate change. I don't think people are quite thinking, we weren't quite there yet, you know, when this was being designed. A lot of data went into it. I'm not going to spend any time on this side, but it, on this on this slide, but, you know, we have bathymetry, we've got these, these future climatologies uh, for tropical and extratropical storms. We have sea level rise scenarios. Here's the, um, the sea level rise conditions that we, we looked at. Um, this is from the National Climate Assessment. It's pretty much what's used. This is what is the global. So this would be the, the static. It's not the relative. Okay. So this is what's happening on average across the globe. The black line is the observed historic sea level rise rate. If you just 
extend that out linearly, that, that would be the lowest projected rate. And then this National Climate Assessment came up with these three curves, highest, intermediate, high, intermediate, low. Right? So these are the projected sea level rise conditions. Um, we basically simulate four different points along the highest curve. And of course, the first one, why did you do the highest curve? Right? And it's not because we were trying to say, oh, well, we're going to scare people and we're going to see what the worst case conditions is. It was actually a very smart selection process because what that did was allow us to simulate a 2030 time frame, a 2070 time frame, and then a 2100 time frame. But because of where we selected the point, you actually get a point on the other curve. So for example, the highest sea level rise rate in 2030 corresponds with an intermediate low in 2070. So essentially, we bracketed our risk. Right? So I can look at my quote unquote 2030 results or my increase of you know, certain sea level rise, and that could cover the range from 2030 to 2070, depending on what you think or what you want to believe for a projected sea level rise. Right? Okay? Same thing with 2070, that covered 2070 and 2100. Okay? So it's not that we just selected the highest and we're preaching gloom and doom across the world. No, it's just saying we want to capture as much of the variability as we could in the system. So how did we do this, which is different than, I think, a way that, that anybody's done it before. And this is kind of the unique approach that we took. So we're simulating thousands and thousands of storm events, both nor'easters and hurricanes. We're using a Monte Carlo approach. So this is very statistically robust. Okay. So it's not like we're relying, like FEMA is on kind of one storm and let's just shift that storm during the track lines and see what happens. Right? We're, we're having a huge set that basically we simulate. And that changes based on the global climate model. Right? So as the ocean temperatures change and our projected change, that changes our hurricane, in this case tropical storm intensity, our tropical storm frequency, and this is all work done by Terry Manuel at MIT. So there's these storm sets, we use these storm sets, we simulate them, and now we've got a whole robust set. Tides, discharge, all that stuff is inherently in there, so we don't have to worry about the joint probability. Right? Um, and we also did this for Nor'easter. So we have both nor'easters and hurricanes. That's all, you know, like I, I would say, it's like ragu, right? It's all in there. Right? So you can look at one result and you have everything in the mix in terms of your climate. We wanted to make sure the model had some viability to, to what was going on historically. So we looked at a couple of really landmark storms up in this area. Um, the blizzard of 78, the really famous nor'easter. It's, it's actually the highest water level uh, Boston has ever seen. Um, and there was some data available to that. All these pink locations here along the coastline represent a high water mark that someone observed. That's the best data in the world, right? Because it's somebody going out there and saying, oh, I think the water got up here based on some mark on the side of a wall or a building. But it's some data. Uh, I just picked a point here. This red dashed line is a high water mark. Here's our model simulation of uh, the blizzard of 78. This is an area that actually comes dry at low tide. And you can see all we're really focused on is getting that peak rate, right? So, I, of course, I cherry picked this one so it's perfect, right? But generally, they're within three inches, okay, of the high water line. So, not bad. Not bad for 78. We didn't stop there. We also looked at the perfect storm. This is the uh, famed, right, movie. <laughs> It was a big fishing vessel out of Gloucester, right? So this is that storm. Um, it had pretty, it was a big storm. In fact, this is the highest storm surge. It didn't happen at high tide, like the Missouri 78. So this is the actual highest storm surge we've seen here. Um, and the second highest total water level. And this we had actual some, some time series data. So this is a point in Rhode Island. Um, again, the blue is our model, the red is the observed, and we track the tide and, and relative surge pretty closely. Right? And so these time series are actually probably within an inch of the actual measured data. So the model's doing a pretty reasonably good job on, on some of the historic sources. Okay? So now we're using that to then simulate all those historic storms as well as these whole set of synthetic events from, from MIT. Just an example of what this thing looks like, just to get some feel. So the arrows are wind, 
magnitude, so we're getting wind information out of this too, which is, is pretty interesting from the standpoint of some insurers, as you can imagine. Um, water levels are indicated by these color scales, so you can see the red, 3.6 meters, NAV 88. Um, so this is a, one of the hurricanes that had a pretty decent track line at Boston, right? Um, it's hard for a hurricane to get in there. Not so hard for an east nor'easter. Another reason why nor'easters are so important. In our in our early simulations, and by early I mean 2030 time frame, nor'easters far dominate the impact on Boston. As you start to go out to 2070, 2100, hurricanes start to become more of a player because they become more frequent up in this area according to global, global climate models. This up waves. So the, like I said, the waves they talk to each other on each time step. So this is wave information in Boston. Um, pretty important when you're Looking at some of these outer coasts, not so important when you're getting uh, inside. Wave heights really don't get that that high up in the inner harbor. This is just a zoom in of one of the cases. Uh, I, I like this one because it, it kind of shows what's happening up in the, the river systems, right? So here's the Mystic River, here's the Charles River. You can see how well the Charles River Dam is actually keeping that water level go going down. That blue is it's keeping it low. At the peak of this storm, and this is about a 2070 uh, sea level rise condition storm scenario, the dam itself doesn't actually get overtopped. It actually gets flanked, both from the north and south, and, and the flanking on the north actually comes from the Mystic River all the way down to the Charles. So something is, if I'm an engineer, I'd probably be thinking about this local zone, hey, yeah, I've got it good, I'm up to that far level. But in reality, they, they miss the low-lying land and flood pathway that was coming across the other side. All right. As a quick aside, I don't want to leave sediment supply out because Chris really focused on sediment supply. In Boston, right, we don't care about sediment supply. We don't care about the changing landscape so much, right, because it's, it's like all hard as walls and concrete and stuff like that. But in other places in the state, which we're now simulating, we have systems with barrier beaches. This is Plum Island area, Great Marsh system, that change. Right? They erode, they migrate, they move, the marshes change. As another project, we've been looking at how marshes and natural resources change throughout the entire state. Okay? So our model is actually for the statewide, not for Boston, is integrating topographic changes in time. Right? So this is these are some results. And just looking at the different natural resources, this is a SLAM model, sea levels affecting marsh migration. Um, here's the system as it is today, mapped by National Wetlands uh, Inventory. So you can see pretty healthy marsh systems, tidal flats and shoals. And then this is what happens if you start to look at into 2030, 2050, big breakdown in 2070. Uh, it, it all of a sudden went from basically, um, basically a lot of high marsh to a lot of low marsh. Right? And then as you go out to 2100, it, it, you know, you can see how the tidal flats have just completely disappeared. A lot of open water. I got to talk to Chris about how that's going to affect the barrier beach going forward, right? So we're integrating these, these results of how the marshes are changing into the model throughout the whole state. Okay, so it's not like we're saying, hey, well, the measured system we know today, that's what's going to exist in 27. No, it's changing as we go. Right, so... What do these maps look like? They're different. <laughs> They're different than your traditional flood maps. They don't just show, oh, here's, here's water, here's how deep it is. What they're really showing, and I apologize, this is kind of hard to read, is exceedance probability. Okay? So it's basically the chance you're going to get wet. Okay? Um, I like to explain it like this, and, and this is going back to trying to get people to understand things. Right? When you wake up in the morning, check your weather, right? You can understand when it says there's a 50% chance of rain today, you know what that means. Layperson has a pretty good idea what that means. There's a 20% chance, they have a pretty good idea what that means. That's sort of what this is, right? So and if you're in these zones, there's a, you know, this green zone, for example, this is 2013, kind of present day, there's a 1% chance you're going to get wet each year under that climate, right? So we'll focus on this area right here, which is just north of of Logan Airport. Um, right now, this area is a, is, has a very clear flood pathway, has some flooding at about a 1% level. If I jump forward to 2030, 
sea level rise climate conditions, now I've jumped up to, oh, 5 to 10 percent risk or probability, if you will. So if I'm a stakeholder there, I can look at my present day probability of 1 percent, and I can look at my 2030 risk probability, 5 percent, and I can say, when do I start to become uncomfortable with this? Right? If I'm a hospital, for example, partners hospital group, they're uncomfortable with this point one. They don't want any risk whatsoever. They're planning for that today. Right? If you have a parking structure, eh, <laughs> I can deal with a 50% risk that I'm still okay before I need to take adaptation. Um, what this does is, is gives people the ability to know what they should plan for and then really put when. Right? When does that, that tipping point for me where my where I get nervous about you know, having problems here, right? They can also compare their relative assets. So if I have a hospital here versus here, or, you know, something that doesn't have, is less important, they can start to weigh out where to prioritize their funding. Oh, by the way, this is 27, okay? So now we really, <laughs> this area has really become inundated. Now we're talking, you know, 30, like 50%, right? So that's two years, right? Every other year you got a chance that you're pretty much going to get wet from something. Okay? So these maps are really useful for that planning purpose and approach. But we don't stop there. You can also get depth, right? So you can get any risk level or probability level. This happens to be the 1%. And I can say, okay, tell me what the 1% depths are. And I can pull out whatever the depths are here, you know. So now I'm talking about a one foot or so depth because of depth. Jump to 2030 with that same, and now I'm up to about two and a half, three feet. 2070, okay, now I'm really tipping at four or five feet of water. Right? So again, if I know what my risk level is, where I'm concerned, I also have some designing guidance. Right? How high do I need to make this one to elevate? When do I when do I stop worrying about adaptations and worry about retreats? Or letting the water come in and then coming back and recovering afterwards, right? So all that information can be garnished from this. Let me try to take it to kind of a little bit more a level here. And again, this is just for Boston, but we have, we've done this for Galveston, for EPA, we've done this for, for Grace Harbor in Washington. Um, this is a, this black outline here is the fuel depot complex for Mass DOT, okay? They were going, they were basically going to turn this into their District 6, which is Boston, main maintenance complex, right? They went into the design process. They were building buildings here. They were, the engineer called us and said, hey, um, what should I elevate this to? I, I see it's in the FEMA flood zone. And I said, well, okay, let's take a look. So we looked at, this is the present day risk, and we said, okay, well, you know, you're, you're okay. You got about, you know, 2%, 1% risk level in that area. Yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. Um, just to point out the res high resolution of the model, you can see there's a small marsh creek here. This is, you have water coming through that marsh creek, and you have water coming back from this. This is along the Ponce River. They said, well, do you have access? They said, well, what's the real depth? That's what we care about, right? So present day, I said, okay, well, here's your 1% risk depth, right? It was about half a foot. They said, oh, that's not a problem. We can still get there. Um, you know, this parking area might be flooded, but it's only half a foot. We can elevate some of these buildings we're designing great, okay? I said, but wait, <laughs> what happens in 2030? Now all of a sudden you're at a 20% risk level, right? Um, that's pretty, you know, that's, you know, five years, right? Um, your depths are two feet. You can no longer get there. And this is, again, if the storm is going on and this is the major maintenance facility for Boston, that might be a little bit of a problem. And they said, well, ah, okay, well, how long is it going to last? Well, because we have this dynamic model, we can actually look at the residence time in the water, how long it's going to be there, which is kind of an important thing, too. People like say, well, how long am I going to be out of service, right? So in this case, it was 10 hours to be out of service. They looked at this and they said, you know what, We're, they mixed the whole project. They said, this is not a good location for our primary basically. we got to pick a different location. And so they, the engineer said, we, we can't do this here. We can't elevate that high. It's, we want this thing to last at least 50 years, and you know, by 20, 30, 15 years from now, the risk is too high for us. Okay. I mentioned the dams. You know, 
we're working for a lot of communities now because of this model. We, they wanted to know when did the dams start to fall apart, right? Um, so we looked at when they were flanked, when they were over top. I'm not going to spend tons of time on this, but I want to just point out the joint probability tool here that we get out of this. So we have discharge coming down the river, and we have then, and this is a case where the, the dam is flanked. This is the Charles River Dam. Um, the green is areas where I basically, in, I had a 24-hour, 100-year precipitation event occur, meaning discharge down the river with the storm surge. And you can see it doesn't do that much more. Why? Well, storm surge just completely dominates, right? When you have the power of the ocean coming in versus some discharge coming down the river, the discharge down the river really doesn't matter too much in terms of extent. But where it did matter was depth. Right, so I've got added water now in the system. The pumps can't keep up anymore. I've got flanking of the dam. And so now I've got an additional two feet of water or so down here, an additional about a foot of water in these basins. That's pretty important information. I'm going to skip the Ale White River, but same there. Local communities are an issue. This is a, this is area in Hingham, right? So this is how local community would potentially use this information in this data. This is a pump station for their sewer system. Okay, it was inundated in 2030 at about a 2% level, okay, actually it was a 5% level. So this is the inundation, what you can get out of this is percent exceedance curves, okay. So in 2030 there was a 5% chance it was going to get wet and then here's the increasing percentages at, you know, 1% it was, you know, this much water, right. So here's the ground elevation of that pump station, here's your associated probability exceedance curve. This is the curve for 2070. So by 2070, that pump station had a 50-50 chance of getting wet, and then here's your depth as a function of various probabilities. Okay? We worked with Kleinfelder here in, in Cambridge to then start to develop, okay, how do we prioritize these things? That no pump station was one asset they had, but they have tons of assets, right? They have a lot of other pump stations. They have roads, they have their library, they have schools. So there needed to be some way to rank these, right? So we took the probability of failure out of the model and multiplied that by the consequence of failure. What is the consequence of failure? That's just basically a something that was developed with the community in terms of how important is that asset. Meaning if that pump station goes out, what happens? Right? You lose you lose your whole town service, is it does it go on? Can you not repair it? What's the cost? All these types of things get integrated into there. You can then put all those together and you come up with this composite risk score. I'm not going to spend tons of time on this, but basically this provides the ability to rank your assets. Right? So in this case, this road intersection had a higher risk score than the pump station. So hey, the road intersection was a higher priority than the pump station. Right? Okay. Now we're going to change gears. So that, <laughs> that was basically how do we determine what's at risk and what's vulnerable. Now, what are we going to do? Okay. Traditionally, there's this, this retreat, accommodate, or protect model, right, in terms of how you're going to adapt to climate change and sea level rise. It goes way beyond that, though, right, if you really start thinking about things. So there's, there's gray, green, or hybrid type solutions. Gray is your more traditional seawalls, your hard infrastructure. Green is, you know, your beach nourishment and those type of things. Hybrid, I'll, I'll touch on a little bit, just combinations of those things. Um, there's local or regional adaptations, right? So local means you're fixing that particular asset right there. You're flood proofing a building. You're elevating a building. Regional means there's a flood pathway somewhere that maybe I can cut off at the coast and save not only that building but a whole bunch more, right? A whole bunch more stakeholders. There's now or later. We talked about that a little bit, right? This phased idea. Do I have to do it now? Or can I wait till later? When does my risk tolerance become too big? Uh, there's modular or more traditional, right? So I'm really big into the modular stuff right now, like adaptable through time. So like if I'm going to recommend a seawall somewhere, we don't have to make it so you can't see the ocean, right? We just need to get it to a certain level and then observe what happens with climate change and then make it so that it's easily added onto if necessary, right? There's singular or redundant. A lot of the mass port stuff that we worked on at the airport was redundant. Meaning they wanted not only a fix locally for their system, they also wanted the regional. So they wanted a flood wall at the entrance to where the flood point was, and they wanted their building flood proof. Or an inflatable wall, uh, wall around that too. 
They want a total redundancy. They can't be down. Logan can't be down. The military's got to come in. It's got to be up. There's removal or fix. That's an operational thing. So, you know, do we bring in the wall? Do we bring in the adaptation? Or do we, do we have it there all the time? Right? There's by probability, right? And then by consequence. I just kind of went over that, right? So, do you base it on that? Courtesy of Chris, I just added this, by drivers of change, right? So, if waves are a big impact, maybe that's a different adaptation than if you just have a still water elevation, okay? If sediment supply, and I'm going to point out an example of that as a big impact, that drives what your adaptation might be. Here's the biggest one. Right? I can come up with 18 different adaptations for an area, but unless I have good partnerships, it might not work, right? Stakeholders have to get together. We have some areas in Boston which are trying for just an easy fix for a regional solution. It saves a whole bunch of stakeholders, but they all have to be on board. Right? It's easy for hospital group to go and protect their hospital because they can, can work on that. It's, it's a lot harder for them to go to the source of the flooding, not only save their hospital, but save the entire community around it. Right? Because it, I don't want to pick that. Right? All right, so here's some gray adaptations. I've spent tons of time on what these are, but I mean, you've seen this stuff. There's tie gates and barriers and adjustable, you know, seawall type situations. There's more traditional. There's elevating. Um, I'm going to go through a few examples because um, I think it's worthwhile. Um, this is a case study we did for Broughton, Long Island in Connecticut. <clears throat> They're very developed area, okay, a lot of houses. Um, they also had a lot of already pre-existing coastal structures, right? So I can tell you, as a coastal engineer, as Woods Hole Group, we're not, you know, pro-structure. Let's build groins and seawalls. We're not that. In fact, we lean more towards the more environmental green infrastructure type solutions. But in this case, it was already there. There was really nothing we could do. Um, and so there was, you know, seawall modifications, some modular seawalls here. There was this barrier rising gate design that we had pitched into this little harbor region. And then there was some diking and culverts that we did to, to basically keep the marsh but limit the flood. Okay. So that's kind of a mix of what was happening. A lot of gray type infrastructure designs in that case. Uh, green adaptations. There's the beach nourishment, dune restoration, berms, the marsh restoration. The big one dissipating some of that energy. Reefs, wet flood proofing. Uh, there's bioengineering with kind of biodegradable structure. Living shorelines, which to me is kind of, living shorelines is definitely the thing as well as green, but it's kind of verging on the edge of hybrid, right? There's, there's a lot of, you know, like of silt that's rock, for example, that, you know, so it's, it's a little bit more of a hybrid. And then, you know, living with the water. Right? Seattle has a place that's just floodable. We're going to let it flood. And we're going to make, you know, it's going to be okay when it floods, and then it'll come back after. And, and that's okay, too. Um, okay, so a little story. This is, this would be the sediment supply one. Sandwich, Massachusetts. If anybody's from the area, that you may have heard this in the paper recently. It's a very hot area. The uh, Cape Cod Canal exists just up drift of it. It has a large, you can see it here, large jetty structure. Completely cuts off the sediment supply. There's no bypassing. It, 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 they sand tightened it. They've raised it. They've done everything good. For good reason, the Cape Cod Canal is a pretty important navigable waterway. But this poor community just got slammed. Right? They have no sediment supply. Right? They're basically, you know, um, to steal a term from Chris, cannibalizing themselves because wood storms come in, it takes the sand off the dunes, rips it offshore, and then moves it along once it, it's offshore. So. You know, this little, these poor people tried to build some dunes here temporarily. They, those go away in one storm, they're gone. Um, it's a really tough situation. Um, they're losing homes. So there was a set of supply issues, so it made a lot of sense for a beach nourishment project with a dune restoration, okay, to protect those. Um, we worked with the Corps. The Corps was even willing to give us the same. Right? They're going to dredge the canal, 150,000 feet yards of sand. Let's put it on the beach. Let's design this nice dune and, and beach property out front here. It's going to be great. The core would pay 65% of it. The town would only have to pay 35. Wonderful. Okay. So you, we did everything right. 
right? Got all the permits and worked with, with the bird people, but they were happy, we're designing stuff in the piping plumber. What happened? This eroded so much, it eroded away from public property all the way back onto private property, right? The core, federal tax money, right? We can't spend your tax money unless it benefits the public. We need easements. We need permanent easements, public easements, so people can use that beach out there. There were 14 homes. We got three out of the 11 to sign the public easement. Project set. Sands, now we're working to get the town's going to pay for 100% and put it somewhere else. But it just demonstrates, you know, that whole partnership piece at the end, it, the public easement thing. Why they don't sign, I don't know. Right? They basically cost their homes because they're going to lose their homes the next one. Right? And if you look at the design, I mean, I mean, I don't know about you, but if I'm, their property line's right up in here. If I'm going to the beach, I'm not taking my blanket over a sand fence back here and putting it in this grassy field. Right? I'm going to be out here somewhere, which is public thing. Another story, but again, just the point being, you can do everything perfectly, adaptations, you know, and you still might trip up, okay? Thin layer dispositions is a project we're doing in uh, Connecticut, in the uh, pond. Uh, I got some pictures here from Vince, too. Um, some work that's been done down in uh, Virginia and then Rhode Island. This is basically just let's spread some sediment, try to keep the marsh up with sea level rise. So in cases where you don't have a good sediment supply, feed near marsh, you got to help it out a little bit. So this is kind of a thin layer deposition. Let's create marsh along the way as we go, combating that sea level rise condition. This is one of my favorites. This is um, East Chop Beach Club on Martha's Vineyard. Okay, um, old old beach club, very historic building. Um, these are the bathhouses on each side, and then here's the beach club main house. This is low. This has nothing to do with sea level rise and climate change because this thing is in trouble now. It, it gets a little bit of a storm, and it's got water there, right? So, you know, their, our recommended approach to them is, is, is more kind of living with the water and actually wet flood proofing. So they want to let water actually go through the building. So it's structurally re-enhancing the building. When a storm's coming, we actually open the doors. We let the water go through, we let the water go under. We're going to probably elevate too. But the idea there is just save the building and we can deal with water going through there. We just don't want to lose the building itself, right? So, kind of an innovative approach to, you know, uh, that, that site. Here's some other, just, just some other ideas to throw out at you <laughs> of things that are happening. Um, one of the big things that some of the, and, and you know, going back to the tie that Elizabeth said, you know, we got to get architects and engineers together a little bit more. Architects and, and have a lot of ideas, right? And there are a lot of interesting, innovative ideas, right? Now, the engineers don't really understand these interesting, innovative ideas, but, but here's one of them, right? So this is this is a work that we've done. This is the Structures of Coastal Resilience. I am involved with that group, but this is a site in New Jersey. So here the idea is, let's make this amphibious suburb, right? So we gotta start changing people's perspective. Instead of thinking of sea level rise as something that is a, oh no, what are we gonna do with sea level? Think of it as an opportunity, right? So the opportunity is, well, instead of maybe having traditional grass lawns, we have marshes. We live within the marshes. So we elevate the roadways, we elevate the buildings, um, and maybe we even have an amphibious canal system in that maybe we have a, a major road that serves as a barrier, but basically saying we're going to live with this situation better and, and adapt to it. And that's part of the, you know, changing your perspective. I still think these, er these ideas need to be tested by engineering, but, you know, that's another story. Here's another one of those. Again, same group, structure of coastal resilience. This is for Norfolk, Virginia. This idea is called fingers of higher ground. Right? So they're going to basically adapt through time, and these, this is kind of an interesting aerial shot. You can see how through time you're basically going to build additional fingers where you basically put your highest priority community assets, uh, say, for example, shelters, right, at the end of these highest finger ground, uh, fingers of higher ground, and then you basically shape your system so that water is kind of coming in through different areas, but you're basically protecting your community. 
um, through these various fingers, so to speak. Again, something I think needs to be tested. But just some additional ideas. So those are the types of adaptations you can have. Um, I'll come back to the model on that in a second, because there's a really cool little trick you can do with the model on that. But here's this regional or local. Like, what should we do? Okay, so remember this little area we were focused on? This is the, the Greenway area in, in East Boston. There, there's a very clear, you know, single flood point of injury here that floods a bigger area. Right? So, you know, it'd be much easier to do a regional solution here than, you know, flood proof or, or adapt all these homes and businesses back in here, right? So, as long as they can get together, it makes a lot of sense to, to do something here. And so, this approach is basically saying, okay, here's your concepts as you go forward with time. Here's your, here's what we recommend you do, and here's the cost. Right? So in this case, we said, you know, a modular seawall here would be great. We can do some stuff along the greenway. There's a couple points you get cut off. This was actually something they recently built and designed for a nice walking path, but it's way low. It's, just flood, it's a flood channel, essentially. Um, Massport's totally on board because that's one of their big, you know, it floods their security center. It floods a bunch of stuff in there. So rather than, you know, doing all, everything in here, they could just do one project. Right? So you got to think about where's the water coming from. Right, as opposed to just while I'm getting water. Right? It's a pretty important concept. When to do things, this is uh, work we've been doing for UMass Boston. Um, this is one of their main entry points here off Morrisley Boulevard. And again, this idea is now or later. Right? So the green is you don't have to do anything. Orange, you can start to consider it. Yellow, yellow you bad, and red, you're kind of in trouble. Right? So again, here's your recommended adaptation option. Here's where your water levels going to be going forward. Here's your cost. This was a case of a hybrid solution of a berm and then a tide gate structure. Okay? It was basically coming in here, flooding from the backside and then flooding through a pathway through here. I like this approach, you know, kind of waiting to see, right? Because, you know, the biggest problem, the biggest uncertainty with all this is those sea level rise steps. It's not that my model might be off by a couple inches. It's because I don't know really what sea level is going to do in a couple years. You saw a huge range on that, right? It's meters. Right? So if I can buy any time that you need to observe and watch what's actually happening with sea level rise, great. Because right? then that will help me determine when do I establish a trigger point where I really have to start to think about adaptation. All right. Great. Less some time for questions. First off, all of this stuff on the Mass DOT in Boston, there's a report out there. You can get it from Mass DOT. Okay? It covers that modeling stuff in much more detail than what I just did. Um, goes into the tides, everything else. Um, also looked at those adaptations, how you set to do adaptations. Um, Steve Miller, so come see me if you want direct access to it, I'll, I'll help you out there. But that covers everything. That's the report. That work is being extended. I showed you that area just around Boston. It is being extended right now to the entire state of Massachusetts up to the 30-foot contour. So Cape Cod, the island, um, we've already used it for a number of different communities. Uh, Ingham being one, uh, all we're working on right now, where they're using these results from this model to do their community planning, prioritization, adaptations. Um, so that's out there. Um, the actual GIS map LIDAR data is going to be available as well on the website. So you can actually go in there and download those risk maps I showed you those probability maps as well as the depth maps for different percent occurrences, and then use that. We we work with Harvard University; they're doing their climate change stuff right now. They they have our data. MBTA, Boston Water Sewer Commission, Parks Healthcare, all using this information to basically do their their plan. Um, so you know the high resolution model provides you know flooding results for projected climate change scenarios. But I would also you know the whole thing with peer review. Across the way. We just didn't do this in a black box, okay? Bui, the Coalition, Graphic Institute, USGS, NOAA, Army Corps, USDA. Army Corps, at the same time we were doing this work, was doing, maybe some of you know about the North Atlantic Comprehensive Coast Study. They were doing that. A little bit different purpose. They're looking at the whole coastline of the coast, and they're basically, you basically get good information along the coastline, but not into the high resolution areas that we really looked at here, right? 
Um, you know, I think it, the modern type is kind of realistic probabilities, right? A lot of times I've seen too many presentations that, you know, you see the newspaper picture, here's what New York's going to look like, right? And there's water everywhere, right? That, that doesn't help. Like, I, I need something to plan my adaptations to, not just the end point of the worst case scenario. So we're hoping this helps with that. Um, you know, assets can be prioritized using those probabilistic results, okay? So you can take the probability, the importance of your asset, put those two together and say, okay, I'm going to wait on these. The communities like that a lot, right? Because they, they, what they really need is where do I spend my money and how much is it going to be? Where do I, where do, I do it all? And when? When do I have to plan for that? So that, that's useful. Um, you know, spanning a wide range of types, phasing is important. I just mentioned the trigger points for adaptation. That's really, I think, important because you don't want to invest tons of money um, the chance that sea level rise is going to do that. I don't know if it's going to actually go project at that level, right? I'm planning for it, which is why, but I want to monitor it over the next 10, 15 years before I commit to saying, okay, we got to do this now. You know, if I just do it now, based in, in all of a sudden sea level rise goes the other way. So think so. Well, let's say it talks, right? Or it slows down a lot, right? Then do I really need to spend all that money, right? And, and here's the other thing that we're doing, and we've already done. For the model right now has also been tied to various other models. So we've tied it to an economic model, right? So Jim's idea of like we got to tell people, you know, what the consequence is of not taking action, right? We've done that. So in Galveston, we ran the whole probabilistic model set, and we said, okay, let's see what our economic impact is on the community if we don't change it, right? Then we said, let's extend this Galveston seawall further to the west, rerun it, and see what the change in the economic impact would be. Okay, so, and we're working with uh, industrial economics out of Cambridge. Almost inevitably, in every case, the adaptation is extremely, or so much cheaper than the, you know, doing nothing much, right? Now, you can say for a seawall, you didn't really need to run. Right? If I have a seawall, I, I kind of know what's happening. But it's great for those marsh restoration projects, for those floodable zones, for those fingers of higher ground. I can put that landscape in the model, rerun it, and then actually see what the consequence might be. Um, I already mentioned we've tied it to the ecological modeling. That's that kind of how marshes are migrating through time. We've done that. And we've also been tying it to the pipe infrastructure. Right? So in Boston, right, one of the big things is, okay, now my Boston Water and Sewer Commission, now my water has a higher downstream tailwater head. I can't get out. Is it going to back up my pipes? Right? So we're giving them information to run their models to say, okay, how is it going to back up my system? All right, so a lot of ground we covered. Um, but you know, I wanted to give you a feel of what we're kind of doing, where we're heading with how communities are handling the planning for this, um, and then what adaptations you know might be available, what adaptations we've been working with um, trying to put into place, uh, at least in the Northeast. So that's it. Thanks.
Um, in Louisiana, they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars building islands that are really miles offshore in March. Is there any interest or effort to model how, how these islands are going to uh, reduce the risk of or improve marsh resilience? Uh, there's, there's certainly interest from my perspective in doing that. Um, I have not. Uh, I guess I'll, I'm sorry, I formally worked in the state of Louisiana, and we did do some modeling that, um, not only with the master plan, we looked at it collectively as what it does, but we did specific tests to see how we're building their islands and what heights we're building at, how wide they are. Are there, are there ways that we're designing islands that can increase um, their effectiveness? Um, and yes, yeah, some of the islands are built in areas where there's not communities nearby, but they are protecting the marshes. The marshes are going to protect the communities, and so it kind of builds the multiple lines of defense that you need in the area. And um, so there is a study out there by Arcadis that shows how you can design these restoration projects to increase your effectiveness and to increase your weight. Very tight. Thank you. <laughs> You mentioned coupling between the model and the ecological model for the Colorado Homeland, and then couple the two and be able to put a value on collective conservation. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to go against Jim and Chris on one thing. So, you know, one thing they always said is, you know, well, if you don't have any development, there's no disaster. I don't know if I fully agree with that because I'm working with a lot of people that said, my marsh is getting blown out there, and that's a pretty huge disaster, and, and there's upland infrastructure that doesn't let it migrate. So now I just have a disaster, even though it was totally undeveloped, because I lost my natural resource, right? So we certainly are tying it directly to the ecological model. Um, and yes, we are working on trying to tie that then to the economics. So each community that we've been doing work for, you know, we talked about the, I talked a lot about the assets today. And by assets, it doesn't just mean their structures and roadways and pump stations. It also means their natural resources. So we have a whole evaluation we do of their natural resources in their community too, and look at ad adaptations just for those um, that maybe co-benefit with some of the more infrastructure-based assets. Um, we haven't gotten to something tied to the economics yet. <laughs> We'd like to. So. For example, way like communication services get from marsh like and we will be not easily but rather easy to quantify but we get a reduction in our quantification. Sure. How would you quantify you know about the effect of tissue? Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean we would need biologists to help us with you know if we restored this much marsh or this much marsh, you know, what does that mean in terms of fishery benefit? That's something that's out of my you know area of expertise for sure. But an interesting idea. <laughs>